Dr. Keel is associate professor at uh, University of Washington. He's the Fleming Professor for Undergraduate Education in the School of Oceanography. He's interested in organic geochemistry um, and particularly uh, good tracers for um, environmental issues such as climate change and pollutant distributions. One of the things we'll learn tonight is why the fish in Puget Sound are so tasty. Uh, with this uh, particular introduction, uh, Rick Keel. Uh, by the way, Richard Keel is not related to the Richard Keel in the James Bond movies with the shiny teeth. I just thought I'd Thanks so much for braving the horrible weather to get here. I really, really appreciate that. And if uh, I drink too much and I, I don't, I can't speak very well anymore, there's two things I want you to remember. First is that the uh, single most abundant cooking spice found in Puget Sound is artificial vanilla derived from petroleum. And that's what we're going to talk about today. And the second thing isn't really related to our research, except a friend of mine, Peter Raymond, uh, just did a study on the East Coast that, that came out last week in Environmental Science and Technology that suggested that 10% of the things that we put in our body are also derived from petroleum. So if you take a vitamin, Almost all of the vitamins that you're eating were made through an industrial chemical process, starting with things like crude oil. And so um, that's, to me, just a really interesting little tidbit that kind of feeds into some of the fun research that we do in the School of Oceanography at UW. I'm going to talk to you about this thing called Sound Citizen. Uh, my name is Rick. I put my name underneath. Brittany runs the project and she's sitting here. If I, if I say anything really intelligent, it's because of the amazing research that Brittany has done. And you can go to our website and find out more information, uh, soundcitizen.org. So you've probably heard of us. We get a lot of press around the Christmas time. We get on the radio and in the news because we've done some pretty silly research uh, relating what kinds of things we eat and then how they get out into food and sound. So our, our work on cooking spices cinnamon vanilla. I'm going to show you some of that data. Um, for everybody who thinks that our research is really funny, there's the blogger online who thinks that we're just about full of hits. And so one of my most favorite blog lines is that Seattle must think that our our products don't smell because they're getting out into the sound. So, um, but really for us, it's okay if people laugh at the research that we're doing because one of the points is to drive home how connected we are to environment, to our environment. And I was reminded of that this morning when two of the crows I found me on my way to work. I was walking the UW and they must have a nest up there and they came down and really let me know that my environment was right there. I'm living out in, out in the world. And we do the same thing to them, man. Every time we flush the toilet, it goes to a sewage treatment facility where it's treated, but a lot of stuff gets out of the facility and into the environment. And there's a very close connection. And there's something happening in the United States today called environmental apathy, which we probably don't have, but it's a growing concern where people think, I don't want to watch the news. I don't want to hear about that compound because all I hear is that what I'm doing is bad for the environment. And so we thought, well, if we ask research questions about things that maybe aren't so bad for the environment, we could get people's attention and we could learn things about how we connect to the world. We also discovered along the way that all of these wonderful things that we are so heavily invested in need to be evaluated as well. So at our house, we are, uh, have the luxury of having a, a big enough income that we can buy green products and try and live maybe a healthier life. And some of the research we're conducting makes us really start to question whether the green process is all about making money or whether it's really about trying to be good stewards of our environment. And so one thing we'll try and talk about tonight, I hope, is you know what's the confluence of those two things, the economics of having our society versus the responsibilities we have to treat the environment nice, nicely. So you might ask, why spices? Well, as I insinuated at the beginning, they have natural sources, things that grow out in the yard, and they have anthropogenic sources. We make them. 
from other things. We make them from petroleum, for instance. Now, they're currently on study. You might think that, oh, we know a lot about cooking spices, but we actually don't know what they're like in the environment, how they're being moved around. And the growing demand for cooking spices is outstripping our ability to process these things out of the environment. So, for example, the amount of vanilla that the world consumes each year is about 10 times greater than the amount of vanilla that's extracted out of vanilla beans. So about 90% of the vanilla that we consume comes from petroleum or it comes from wood products. In the 1970s, we used to make artificial vanilla from pulp and paper. Now we mostly make it out of petroleum because there were worries about vanilla compounds having chlorine atoms attached to them and then they become chlorinated compounds which can cause cancer. So uh, we have these artificial things like vanilla and they're working their way into the environment. But uh, like I said at the beginning, if we just think about spices, they're kind of a fun way to address this connected nature that we have to our environment. So here's some chemical um, diagrams of the, of the spices we're looking at. We're gonna focus on four or five. We measure about 20 different cooking spices. Um, cinnamon, we can tell the difference between cinnamon that you put on something and then you didn't eat, or the cinnamon that goes through your body because your body changes the aldehyde into the acid, so we can tell whether you're eating or not. We're gonna do parsley, sage, rosemary, and thyme. Uh, vanilla, ethyl vanilla, and methyl vanilla. So we can do uh, natural vanilla, artificial vanilla, uh, burned vanillas, things that, the, the nice smell that you get when you make a waffle in your house or you make pancakes, that's the conversion of vanilla into the methylated form of vanilla. It smells really nice, but because it smells nice, as an industry, we make that compound and we put it into foods too. So we can tell the difference between a, a nice smelling vanilla that was produced by a natural process or what was put into a food on purpose to give it that actual same flavor. Uh, what we do is we have a citizen volunteer network where people go out with these kits. I hope that uh, somebody will take this kit home today and that many of you might go and request your own kits online. You do some water sampling, I'll talk about that at the end. And then you send the sample back to the lab where one of our undergraduate students takes the sample and processes, processes it through a little cartridge where all of the chemicals we care about stick onto the cartridge and they go out of the water. We take them off of the cartridges and run them in a gas chromatograph mass spectrometer. And that's a fancy instrument. I like to talk about that one because it's kind of fun. So the gas chromatograph part is basically an oven with a straw in it, and we're just pushing air through this straw. But it's a really thin straw, and it's about half of a football field in length, and it's all coiled up inside this tiny little oven. And if you think of the spices as high school students, some of them are just kind of hanging out by their lockers. The lockers represent the walls of the tube. And they're hanging out by the lockers, and they can't hardly get to class on time. And some of the other spices are like, jocks and they're on, the, they're on the sports teams and they're just looking down the hallway and they're making it down really quickly before the bell rings. And so the students kind of separate from each other and the compounds kind of separate from each other and that's how we separate them. And when they come out the other end of the long straw, we break them into little pieces, speed them up to 10,000 miles an hour and smash them into a tiny little wall, which wouldn't want that to happen to me, but we do it all the time for these compounds. That's how we can tell what they are. So that's kind of fun. And all this is done by Brittany and Jackie and a group of undergraduates who run the program in the labs. So it's all undergraduate driven research. When you separate things down the tube, you'll get chromatographs that look like this. The, the bottom axis is time. It takes us about an hour to separate our compounds out. We can run the machine 24 hours a day. The top graph is some of the spices that we look at. The middle one is what comes out of uh, the sewage treatment facility uh, here at West Point. And then the bottom one is a Puget Sound sample. The two big peaks in the Puget Sound sample are part of the derivatizing agents that we add. So they're not, they're not you shouldn't think of those two things as being really uh, big samples in our Puget Sound. But what I hope you'll notice when you look at this is that the sewage facility water, even though it's highly treated, has a lot more little bitty squiggles, a lot more bumps, or a lot more compounds in it than either our standard or Puget Sound. So 
so there are hundreds and hundreds of things coming out of the treated sewage and they're getting into Puget Sound. And we're identifying about 35 or 40 of them. Other scientists measure a whole bunch of other compounds as well. And I have a handout of this that I think I'll, I'll pass around. And so probably the most complicated graph we'll, we'll look at here in the next few minutes. Uh, Liano's holding up the graph, and what I've plotted here is, uh, let's see, one, two, three, four, five different spices for the year 2007. How much of the spice is coming out of, Pu out of Seattle's treated waste and into Puget Sound? The top bars show vanilla in the darker, the darker color, and then artificial vanilla in the kind of more burnt umber color. And you'll notice that they both spike in the summertime, and then they have a spike in the fall. I'm gonna move over here. So we've got the uh, summertime spikes, and then spikes in the fall associated with uh, the cooking holidays, Thanksgiving, Halloween, things like that. And this sample in the middle is the methyl vanilla, or the compound that we create when we make waffle cones. And it kind of pops up only during the summertime. So we think that this is associated with things like kettle corn and uh, making, buy, buying ice cream in, in, in cones and things like that. And we have a couple of our tracers for the holidays, so uh, cinnamon and thyme. We don't see them at all in the summer. And then in, right at the holidays, they just pop right up. So I'm going to zoom in on a couple of these features and talk about them with a little bit more detail.